we need it. And then we've got quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, of course, is, goes beyond these other theories, but um, are there any gaps in quantum mechanics? Usually people say, well, quantum mechanics is so well understood, it's so beautifully confirmed by all experiments, why should I say there's anything beyond quantum mechanics that could be relevant in the brain? That's completely outrageous. It is pretty outrageous. I'm saying that quantum mechanics is A, limited in its scope. That's outrageous already. What's even more outrageous is I'm saying that this limitation is something that the brain is making use of. That's deliberately more outrageous. Let me talk about the first outrageous thing. Well, you see, quantum mechanics works, it's a beautiful theory, it works amazingly well, but it is only known to, it, and it works without exception. There is no known experiment which goes against quantum mechanics. However, in my view, that's not so surprising, because where the quantum mechanics goes wrong, and I think it does go wrong, is when you have large objects. And basically this was appreciated by Schrodinger when he introduced his concept of the, of the Schrodinger's cat, as we call it, where, where you could have a cat which was dead and alive at the same time, and it would not be very difficult at all to produce an experiment where you have, a say, a photon split into two groups, and this one triggers something which kills the cat, and the other one doesn't trigger it, and the cat's alive, and so you follow the Schrodinger equation, the cat, the cat is a dead and alive at the same time. So that's the way the Schrodinger equation works. It's the way that part of quantum mechanics works. But then you say, well, that's not the way you use quantum mechanics, because what you do is you use the wave function to calculate probabilities. Okay, that is the way you use quantum mechanics. You use it to calculate probabilities. But that is not part of the Schrodinger equation. That's the other part of quantum mechanics. And these two parts of quantum mechanics are mutually inconsistent with each other. Now, that can be as hard arguments can go backwards and forwards endlessly. But to me, they are inconsistent with each other. The way you use quantum mechanics is says there's one outcome or another. One is the dead cat, the other is the live cat. You will only find one or the other. You won't see the cat in a superposition of dead and alive, which was the whole point that Schrodinger was making when he introduced this thought experiment of the cat anyway. So he was trying to say, look, my equation, I mean Schrodinger's equation, is, is limited in its scope. And that's what he was pointing out. And Einstein agreed, and, and even Dirac agrees, that there has got to be some, something beyond the standard rules that we have in quantum mechanics. Now, of course, people argue endlessly about that. I happen to think that where the limitation is in current quantum mechanics is when you have enough mass displacement that you have to worry about the effects of general relativity. Now, this is, can be very small. You see, I can take this gadget and move it from here to here. There's already enough, um, enough mass displacement there that if I had a superposition of the two locations, for that superposition to survive for more than a tiny fraction of a second. So I'm claiming that, that there's something has already gone wrong there. You don't usually worry about that because you don't do that solving the Schrodinger equation. You do that by classical physics or by bringing in the measurement part of quantum mechanics, which is inconsistent with the Schrodinger equation. I've been talking a long time about this question because it's a complicated question. <laughs> but my argument is that there is a gap, and that this gap is not understood, and the understanding of it will require new physics, not just better understanding of current physics, but new physics. And that new physics is going to come in at a certain level which could well be relevant to the action of the brain. Now, this is a long, complicated story, and whether you follow this and disagree with me here or here or here or here, you, you might easily do so. But I'm just giving you my point of view. So my point of view is that when we consciously experience something or consciously choose something, there is there <laughs> something <laughs> which is taking advantage of the parts of quantum mechanics or the extension of quantum mechanics that we don't understand today. So what I'm not claiming is that it's the brain is making use of quantum mechanics. It's more outrageous than that. I'm saying the brain is making use of where quantum mechanics is wrong, which is a pretty wild kind of statement, so I'm not surprised people would disagree with me. But on the other hand, 
Consciousness is a pretty strange phenomenon. It doesn't happen, as far as we know, all over the place. Um, that gadget is probably not conscious. Um, <laughs> what's the difference? A huge supercomputer. There's no evidence whatsoever that it's conscious. People might say, well, you know, it, it thinks it understands or something, but there's, there's no real evidence for that. Uh, it seems to me there is something very strange going on, which has taken many um, millennia of years to evolve and enable beings, not just humans, I'm sure, because that, uh, even the cat, the poor cat, which has been putting into a super position, <laughs> in my opinion, has consciousness. And there is something going on there which is not understood, in, not just in detail, it's not even in principle understood according to the physics that we have today, and that we are going to have to develop that physics in ways which may seem not have anything to do with it. Uh, I think we need to develop the physics anyway, quite apart from consciousness. But I am saying that, that, that I do believe that whatever is involved in consciousness, and we're a long way from understanding it, is, is something which uh, needs to take advantage of that. Now, you see, when I wrote the book The Emperor's New Mind, I had no idea what it could be in the brain. And I thought that by the time I had learned enough to finish writing the book, I would get some insight into what it could be. And I didn't. So I had some rather weak thing at the end of the book, which I didn't really believe, to do with um, something to do with synapses or something. Anyway, let's forget about that. Because one advantage about writing a book like that is not that it will encourage young people to learn about physics, which I certainly hoped it did to some degree, <laughs> um, but that maybe other scientists in other fields might read the book and make a connection. And I think I was lucky that this did happen, because Stuart Hameroff, who is an American, what they call anesthesiologist, we call them anesthetist in England, I think, but somebody who puts you to sleep uh, when you're having an operation by giving you a general anaesthetic. And unlike most of his colleagues, who didn't seem to be, I mean, they're very good at putting people to sleep, but they're not so interested in what they're actually doing when they put people to sleep. Whereas he was very concerned with what is really going on when you put somebody to sleep with a general anaesthetic. And he considered, for various reasons, which I think were interesting, that these general anaesthetics acted on these little tubes called microtubules. And microtubules are substructures of cells which are present, I should say, in almost all cells. They're not just in neurons. They are present in, in the liver or in, the, in, the, in the, your little toe. And, uh, and not in red blood cells, but every other cell pretty well. So you, people will obviously raise the question, well, if it's microtubules, why isn't my liver conscious, you see? Well, it's not just presence of microtubules, it's got to be something to do with the role they're playing in, in neurons. Now, some various interesting developments have, come, developments have come about, which I think is your question. You're asking me, what's new, you're saying. <laughs> I'm telling you what's old. So what's new is various experiments. First of all, there are experiments that have been performed by a, an Indian chap in Japan called He's called Anuban Bandiyapadhyay, or something like that. And his experiments were concerned with looking at microtubules and trying to test their conductance when you put uh, a voltage across um, with an oscillating voltage with certain very different frequencies, very specific frequencies. And he finds that with certain, there are eight different frequencies that it suddenly becomes very conductive, but only at those frequencies. And these frequencies are nothing to, not harmonically related to each other, so they're, it's very strange. So you find with these eight different frequencies, suddenly, and they're very different frequencies too, suddenly the microtubule becomes very conductive. It's conductive in a way which is apparently not dependent on the temperature, or even more strikingly, on the length of the microtubule. So it's nothing like saying you've got a certain resistance and the longer the tube, the greater the resistance would be, because, of course, it's got the longer tube will, 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 will have more resistance. But the resistance is more or less the same, no matter how long it is. And even goes down a little bit, the longer the tube is, which is very non-classical. 
Now, he's been doing these experiments for a few years and having a lot of trouble with getting them published and things like this, which I suppose is an experience that some other people find in, in doing things which are a little bit against the grain. Um, but it, he's gaining some, certainly in recent, Recently, he's, he's done other. The original ones were done on individual microtubules in somewhat artificial conditions. He's now looking at live neurons and, um, and noticing these frequencies also play a role in, in axons and things like this. I don't know where it's all going. I don't know what the explanation for these conductance is. Um, it doesn't look classical. It looks like something. I should say it's not superconductance.